using direct products, we can apply silo theory to finite abelian groups. The result is as good as one could hope for. We have the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. So this says if G is a finite abelian group, then G is isomorphic to a direct product of finite cyclic groups. Specifically, if the factors are given as Z mod N1 through Z mod NK, we can arrange it so that N sub 1 is greater than or equal to 2, and each N sub i divides N sub i plus 1. Now, in turn, we could take this result, we'll have the following corollary to check whether two finite abelian groups are isomorphic or not. So if G is a finite abelian group, the isomorphism class of G is given by the list of the orders of elements of G. So if we have two finite abelian groups, Okay, we can list all their elements and compare. If the orders are equal, then the groups are isomorphic. If not equal, then not isomorphic. We note this doesn't hold in general. So there are going to be non-abelian finite groups whose lists of orders of elements agree, but they're not isomorphic. Now, to see the fundamental theorem, the first step, take the order of the group, Okay, we're going to factor it into powers of primes, and we'll consider the CLO P subgroups. Now, because G is abelian, CLO theory is going to say the number of CLO P subgroups for a given P must be equal to 1. So we're going to have a unique CLO P subgroup, and I'll call that H sub P. We note three things that will give us a direct product. First, the H sub P is normal in G and that follows because G is abelian, okay, then every subgroup is normal. We take the intersection of any two of these CLO P subgroups for distinct P, we get the identity element. And that's just by checking orders in each subgroup. Finally, we can write G as a product of our CLO P subgroups. So, if we consider this product on the right-hand side, okay, I'll call that the subgroup H, then what do we have? Well, we note each H sub P is contained in H, so that means each power of a prime is going to divide the order of H. Since each CLO P subgroup is contained in this subgroup, okay, we're going to have that this order is going to be the order of our subgroup, and that means we're going to have all the group. So our three statements hold, and we could form an internal direct product. Summarize, G is finite abelian, then we can write G as a direct product of its CLO P subgroups. Now, to get one step closer to the fundamental theorem, we're going to show the finite abelian P group is a product of finite cyclic groups. We can apply this to each CLO P subgroup in G, and then what remains is bookkeeping. Now, for this statement, Okay, we'll assume the order of our group is p to a power, so p is going to be a prime, and we'll use proof by induction. So we're going to do induction on the exponent of p. When k is equal to 1, okay, the order of the group is the prime p, so g is isomorphic to z mod p, and our result holds in this case. For the induction step, we're going to assume that the result holds whenever the order of the group is p to the n. I'll assume that our group G has order p to the n plus 1. By Cauchy's theorem, we can find a y in G with order p. We'll consider the subgroup generated by y. I'll call that h. Okay, so h is going to be isomorphic to a z mod p. And because our group is abelian, h is going to be normal in G. I could form the quotient group G mod h. That'll have order p to the n, so induction applies. That means we can write g mod h as a direct product of finite cyclic groups. Now, for each cyclic factor, what I'll do is I'm going to pick an x sub i in the group, g, such that x sub i h generates a cyclic factor. So we're picking an element in g, going to cosets, and then that's going to generate a cyclic group. Okay, I want to consider the subgroup generated by all of these x sub i's. There are two things that can happen. 
first, okay, we consider what happens when we intersect H with one of these okay, cyclic subgroups in G generated by X sub I. Because the order of H is a prime, the intersection is either the identity element or all of H. Now, if we have these intersections are always the identity element, we have the conditions for an internal direct product when we add in the subgroup generated by Y. So in this direct product here, we're just gonna add on a Z mod P and we have our result. Otherwise, well, what would have to happen in the other case is that H is gonna be entirely contained in one of these groups generated by an X sub I. And if we count elements, we note if it's in one of these, can't be in any others when we do the counting here. So that means it would have to be in exactly one. And the effect on the direct product here is gonna to be to change some Z mod MI to Z mod PMI. Again, we see that we have our result in this case. Now that we can write our finite abelian G as a direct product of finite cyclic groups, all that's left is the bookkeeping. For that, we note the combination rule for cyclic groups. Okay, we've seen this before. If we have M and N, integers greater than one and relatively prime, then Z mod M N is isomorphic to the direct product of Z mod M and Z mod N. We note for the group on the right-hand side, we have one one as a generator. So it's a cyclic group with order M N. Now, this is the start of a bigger story. Okay, we save that for ring theory, where it's called the Chinese remainder theorem. Now, with this, okay, we have G, okay, our finite abelian group. We're able to decompose it into its CLO P subgroups as a direct product. And then those CLO P subgroups can be written as, okay, products of finite cyclic groups, all orders powers of P. Using this, we can combine the powers of P to get our divisibility result. For an example, let's suppose we have finite abelian groups with order 12. So if we look at the CLOP subgroups, what are the possibilities? Okay, well, for CLO2 subgroups, they're gonna have order four, so they can be either Z2 cross Z2 or Z4. For the CLO3 subgroup, we have only one possibility, it's gonna be a Z3. So we put these together. Then I can use the rule here. I can take the Z3 and combine it with one of the Z2s to get a Z2 cross a Z6. Here, I can combine the Z4 with the Z3 to get a Z12. Okay, and then note we have our groups in the form as in the theorem. Now, we can also apply our corollary if we check orders of elements in each of these groups, okay, so that's just list them all, find their orders. Okay, we know these can't be isomorphic because this has an element of order 12, this one doesn't. And we see that the lists of orders of elements are not gonna match up. So, corollary holds in this case also.